Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another new Savvy Sightseer video vacation. Today we are off to Salzburg and Vienna in Austria. For many Americans, The Sound of Music was our first introduction to Austria and especially the starring city of Salzburg. Who can forget seeing Julie Andrews twirling around and singing up in the Alps? It sparked an interest in me and is part of why I wanted to get there. But ask Austrians about the movie and they know very little. Many never saw the movie. Those aware of the popular musical believe it presents average Austrians in a negative light. They resent the historical inaccuracies depicting their heritage. In fact, while the world celebrated the 50th anniversary of the film's release in 2015, city administration refused a request to name a street after the show's heroine, Maria von Trapp. Instead, when Austrians relate their city of Salzburg with music, it's more the classical kind, that from Mozart. There is so much more to this country than its association with a Hollywood production. It was Marie Antoinette's childhood playground and home base for the rulers of most of Central Europe, the Habsburgs and the Holy Roman Empire. 17th century carillon chimes, trick fountains, imperial jewels, and Roman runes. So much is packed into one tiny country. Today, we'll focus mainly on two of the most well-known cities, Salzburg and the country's capital, Vienna. Salzburg is well known for its famous son, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, the child musical prodigy and prolific composer of the late 1700s. Museums, chocolate, music, calendars, cups, everything that you can put his name on is out there for souvenir shoppers. But for tourists, of course, most are less interested in Mozart and more about the sights they associate with the sound of music. That's the residence Platz fountain where Maria, played by Julie Andrews, is playfully splashing the horse statue while singing I Have Confidence on her way to become governess to the captain's children. One of the first things you realize upon getting to Salzburg is that Hollywood took quite a few liberties when filming. The storyline is loosely based on fact, and it's fun to pick out fact from fiction. The film crew may be long gone, but the magnificent fountain installed in 1656 is still there. Considered to be the most beautiful fountain in the city, it's a very intricate sculpture. There are four snorting horses at the base of a rock. Above them, three giants struggle to support a basin in which three dolphins balance a scallop shell holding the Greek god Triton as he hoists his conch shell trumpet, shooting a jet of water into the air. You can see why it is one of the most significant Baroque monuments in Europe today. The Nunberg Nunnery or Abbey, where the young Maria supposedly spent time as a novice, was founded in 713 and is the oldest nunnery in the world that has existed without interruption. The building is visible from almost every point in the city. The Abbey's church is late Gothic with an impressive vaulted ceiling. You can just imagine the nun's chants reverberating off the walls. Looking out from the Abbey, you can understand why musical Maria was drawn to the lush hills made famous by Julie Andrews as she sang out, The Hills Are Alive. Nunberg is still an active abbey, with nuns running it and giving tours of the grounds. Here you find one of the many deviations from the movie. The dramatic graveyard scene depicted in the film is as a dismal, gray, stark cement cemetery. On the left of the screen, you see the abbey's real burial ground. But that would not have been nearly as thrilling as showing the Von Trapp family cowering behind headstones in the arcades or the gated sections as soldiers hunted them. The type of memorial sculptures in the movie are actually at nearby St. Peter's Cemetery. But there they are flushed to the wall, built into the mountain with no place to hide. This is the rest of St. Peter's Cemetery and where the family actually did hide while trying to escape. The movie scene was filmed on a fabricated Hollywood set with a much more dire atmosphere than the beautiful St. Peter's. It is the oldest Christian graveyard in Austria, dating to about 700 AD, and it is far from a mournful place. The grounds are lovingly tended by family members with lush floral plant, plant, planting, sorry, mainly pansies, whose name means thoughts and symbolize that the lost are not forgotten. On the site of a former quarry where stone was mined for building the town is the Festival Hall. Originally commissioned in 1693 by the Prince Archbishop 
as a riding school for royal horse training, it is now more famously known as the enormous Open Air Festival Hall, where the family last sang in 1937 and from which they did make their escape. It is still in use today as a concert venue. The interior section has 96 arcades, or little niches, that are spread out over three floors from what, which people would watch the horses train. It was converted in 1926 to a concert venue for the Salzburg Festival. The Von Trapps never would have sung Edelweiss here. Christopher Plummer may have crooned Bless My Homeland Forever, but it is neither a folk song nor the Austrian national anthem. Rather, it was composed for the musical by Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein. Edelweiss, though, is the national flower of Austria. Hollywood had the family climbing the Alps to escape to Switzerland. But in reality, they hopped the next train out of town to Italy. And it's a good thing, too. If they had tried to escape Hollywood's way, they would have walked smack into Hitler's camp. The retreat, called the Eagle's Nest, is high in the Bavarian Alps. And it's an interesting study in irony. It was a gift from party heads to the Nazi leader for his 50th birthday. As a retreat and a place to bring and impress foreign and domestic dignitaries. But they didn't take into account some things about Hitler. The view would indeed impress his guests, but Hitler's fear of heights and closed spaces made it impossible for him to spend even one night there. In fact, he only conducted business there about 10 times. Even on a drizzly day, the views of the Bavarian Alps are breathtaking and of course terrifying to a man with acrophobia. Then there was the issue of getting to it. He had to walk through a 406-foot-long tunnel carved into the mountain before taking a 400-foot ride up in an enclosed elevator. The elevator was lined with brass to give the illusion of more space for the claustrophobic Hitler. I asked an Austrian woman who had lived in the United States for several years what it was that she missed most about Austria. She said it was the chiming of the bells. In Salzburg, sounds echo off stone buildings from its delightful glockenspiel high above the former palace called the New Residence. It's actually not so new anymore. It was built in the 16th century. The Carillon's mechanism, completed in 1704, takes up a full room. It operates like a giant player piano as carefully placed pins trigger bells. The drum has almost 8,000 holes. About 100 pins are needed for each song. There's a repertoire of about 50 songs, and each season, the playlist is selected by the descendants of one of the clockmakers who had worked on the glockenspiel's intricate movement mechanisms. The tower's 35 bells chime three times a day. Being in the tower affords not only a close-up of the bells in action, but also, at about 150 feet above ground, a bird's-eye view of the town and fortress. Take a listen. Looming above the bell tower and the city of Salzburg is its imposing Hohen Salzburg fortress. The stark, white-faced castle is reached by the oldest funicular in Austria and is one of the largest existing 11th century fortresses in Europe. So imposing, it had never been conquered. The bleached look of the outside doesn't prepare you for what's inside. Amazingly decorated rooms. There's even a colorful addition to the space between a doorway and the ceiling above. And a carefully crafted marionette display is something else you don't expect given the stark exterior. As in the Sound of Music movie, when Maria and the children perform The Lonely Little Goat Herder, marionette shows were a big deal. Mainly they were for entertainment, but also as parables for good behavior or punishment. From the castle, a mile-long paved path stretches above the old town, providing excellent views of the city and locals out for a walk. Along the path, I came across this incredibly beautiful scene and caught this sort of moment in time. I got a sense of how much she reveres her town. Here's a close-up of her view of Salzburg and the cathedral across from the Glockenspiel from high above. Notice how impeccably clean the city is. Every morning, the predominantly pedestrian-only zone is completely flushed out. Notice in the lower left-hand corner what appears to be a golden orb next to a giant gray and white square. 
Of course, I had to go down and find out what they were. Children and adults alike turned a sedentary pastime into an active one on a living chessboard. And what looked like a golden globe was, well, just that. The sphera was done by a local sculptor for the Salzburg Art Project in 2007 and depicts a man in everyday clothing looking out from atop a gold orb. I guess he just wanted a closer view of the fortress. In the movie, Maria takes the kids to the market where she juggles tomatoes. Salzburg's marketplaces are delightful and brimming over with colorful meat, produce, and flower stalls. Note the size of those peppers. I grow red peppers in my yard and I've never gotten any that size. Getridegasse or Grain Alley is Salzburg's famously old pedestrian shopping street. It's got vintage storefronts that are topped by intricate wrought iron guild signs. Those are a throwback to the times when pictures spelled out the type of business represented. The road itself dates back to Roman times, and its most famous resident, Mozart, was born at number nine. Even newcomers try to blend in, like McDonald's. Although Salzburg is the cultural and geographical center of Austria, Vienna, 180 miles to the east, is the capital and center of political power of the country. It served as the home base for the Habsburgs, who ruled over the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. What you see here is just a portion of the Hofburg, the Imperial Palace, which actually consists of a complex of buildings, wings, passageways, and gardens. It encompasses 59 acres with a range of 18 buildings. Parts of the complex date back to the 13th century. In all, there are 54 major staircases, 19 courtyards, and 2,600 rooms. In 1938, Hitler chose the balcony of the so-called New Wing, which was built in the 1900s, to announce his annexation of Austria by Germany. Today, it houses political offices. This map gives a good visual of just how huge the Holy Roman or Austrian Empire was at its height during the 18th century. Empress Maria Theresa ruled for 40 years, from 1740 to 1780, during which time she had 16 children. The Empress expanded and fortified her empire through marrying off her children. She said, let others wage wars, but you, happy Austria, marry. On display at the Hofburg Palace's imperial treasury are all the trappings expected of rulers of such a vast empire. There are intricate vestments and the first crown of the early Roman Emperor Otto from 962 AD. The Emperor Rudolf II's personal crown dates back to 1602 and contains elements of all three of his roles as Holy Roman Emperor. If you look closely at the crown, you can see the different components. A bishop's, bishop's mitre is in the center, and that's under the Roman helmet arch, and both are set within a king's crown. Rudolf's scepter symbolized his rule over the material world, while his orb demonstrated his rule over the religious world. The orb's four diamonds represent the four corners of the earth over which the emperor ruled. This 11th century jewel-encrusted cross is believed to contain a piece of the original wood used in Christ's cross. The Habsburg's jewels are indeed impressive. I can't help but wonder how one could stand upright with some of the heavy accessories shown here. And then there's the unbelievably detailed vestments woven with silver and gold threads. While the Habsburgs had their own chapel within their compound, they also imprinted their mark on Vienna's main cathedral, St. Stephen's. The soaring 450-foot-tall Gothic southern spire seems a juxtaposition with the variegated tile pattern of its roof. The seemingly odd zigzag design was by intent, not by chance, and was strictly for decoration. It incorporates the Habsburg colors and crest of a double-headed eagle. The colorful roof, with a total of 230,000 glazed tiles, is the most recognizable symbol in Vienna. Composer Beethoven became aware of his deafness when he saw birds fly out of the bell tower while its 23 bells were ringing, but he hadn't heard them at all. I think it's pretty cool to see in the middle of a bustling capital city some Roman runes. Just below ground level near the Hofburg Palace are these remnants of an ancient Roman outpost. They give a glimpse into the history of the square from the time of the Romans up until the late 1900s when they were discovered. I love the contrast of seeing 21st century pedestrians on their cell phones 
with the image of Romans standing guard on the same spot in the first century. A popular place to be in midday is the anchor clock on Hoare Market. An ornate timepiece, the 13-foot clock face sports a noontime sort of mini concert and parade of 12 of Vienna's historical figures, including the Empress Maria Theresa and the world-famous composer Josef Haydn, each accompanied by music from their era. About five miles southwest of Vienna is the summer home of the Habsburgs. It's called Schönbrunn Palace, with 1,441 rooms. It housed about 1,000 people at its height and was the center of court and political life. Extended and rebuilt between 1743 and 1763, a former hunting lodge was transformed into a magnificent 574-foot-wide palace. Schönbrunn is steeped in history. Mozart performed here for the first time for Empress Maria Theresa. It was also the setting for the historic first meeting between U.S. President Kennedy and Russia's, Russia's Khrushchev in 1961 to discuss, among other topics, the future of Berlin. Schönbrunn Palace sits amid 435 acres of gardens, elaborate buildings, even a hothouse of exotic plants and a hedge maze. Here is even the world's oldest zoo, which dates back to 1752. The gardens were open to the public as part of Maria Theresa's determination to make culture available to all. The Gloriette, high on Schönbrunn Hill, was intended as the crowning touch for the estate. The open-sided gallery commands a stunning view. Marie Antoinette referred to the manicured lawns as carpets of green. Of course, not all palaces belong to the Habsburgs. Helbrunn Palace, about 20 minutes from Salzburg, was built in the 1600s purely as a pleasure palace for Salzburg's then ruler, the Prince Archbishop Marcus Sidicus. If the color seems familiar, think about Maria after getting off the bus. She runs along a wall of the same mustard color. No one building was used by Hollywood for exteriors of the Von Trapp Villa. Pieces of other homes were stand-ins, such as Helbrunn's Wall. Elburn Palace has another tie to the sound of music. It is here, far from the Von Trapp family house, that you find the famous gazebo used for the IM-16 number and the love scene between the captain and Maria. Well, almost. The real one was too small for the dance numbers, so they built an interior for the gazebo in Hollywood that was significantly larger. Originally a rock quarry, Helburn was transformed into what is now considered Europe's oldest open-air theater. Fountains like this Roman sea god Neptune pool were built by masons from Salzburg in Italy. These were the best craftsmen of their time. The de Parc has a decidedly less formal side to it. The prince enjoyed dining al fresco at this massive stone dining table. It is important to note the etiquette of the time was for everyone to remain seated at a table until the prince gets up. Otherwise, no getting up for any reason. Let's see how that worked out for the prince's dinner guests. The girl in the blue shirt is seated where the prince would have been. It seems Sidicus was a bit of a fun prankster, or perhaps a bit of a sadist, for his subjects could have faced penalties if they'd ever jumped up and run from the table when the water started spouting from under their seats. Playful statuary and grottos, bushes, and walkways are all fair game for giving unexpected dousings. It's a unique water park, masterfully designed. It is full of surprises and bursts of laughter as water jets suddenly erupt and shower unsuspecting guests. It's been referred to as a Baroque Disneyland, created again for the sole purpose of entertaining the immensely rich Prince Archbishop of Salzburg and his guests. A favorite of mine is a hydro-powered city with 141 characters in action. I find it mesmerizing. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss because sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that to say, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope you've enjoyed 
this little trip to Austria today. To see more of the country or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions at all about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my Programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home. Auf Wiedersehen.